Good afternoon and welcome to the AgriAbility webinar series. My name is Paul Jones. I manage the National AgriAbility Project, which is housed here at Purdue University. Today's uh, topic is hand protection in agriculture. It's actually the sixth webinar in our series that deals with various issues related to disability in agriculture. Before we start, I would like to give you just a few basic webinar instructions. Of course, you need speakers or headphones to be able to hear the presentation. If you have not checked your connection speed, please do that in, under the meeting menu and manage my settings. Dial-up is not recommended for these uh, webinars and is probably not even usable. If you have questions during the presentation, please type those in the chat window and hit the arrow and we will be addressing those at the end. If you have any problems, also please enter those into the chat window or email hooke at purdue.edu listed on your screen. You might want to jot that down. We will be having four quick survey questions at the end, so please stick around for those right before the question and answer period. Also, we will be archiving the recording of the webinar, plus posting the PowerPoint presentation and a transcript on agribility.org under the online training link. For those of you who are not familiar with Agribility, it's a program sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture that assists agricultural workers with disabilities. Uh, each AgriAbility project is a partnership between the state's land-grant university and at least one disability services organization in their state. Currently there are 23 state projects covering 25 states plus the national project again that's a partnership between Purdue University, Goodwill Industries, the Arthritis Foundation, Indiana Chapter, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. If you'd like more information about AgriAbility, please visit our website, www.agribility.org. Our presenter today is Rob Stuthridge. He's uh, our project ergonomist here at the National AgriAbility Project. He has many years of experience in ergonomics and has uh, given a previous webinar on hand controls for agricultural equipment, which is archived at our website. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to Rob for the main part of the presentation. Thanks, Paul. Well, welcome everybody to this uh, presentation. And we're going to consider today uh, hand protection from uh, an agricultural perspective. And the aim of this was to provide information that uh, I felt might be useful to anybody involved with health safety or, or involving um, advising on assistive technology for uh, people with disabilities in agriculture. Well, I have to confess this has been, this has been quite a learning curve for me. Um, I don't profess to be an expert in hand protection, but I, I've certainly learned a few things along the way. So if there are any uh, gaps, omissions, or if you think that I've made any errors in, uh, in the information that I'm giving out, please uh, share that with the group or, uh, or write to me um, the information given um, either on this presentation or at agribility.org or, or phone us via the uh, National Agribility website. I'd be happy to uh, disseminate uh, corrected information. That said, um, hopefully you'll find this useful. And we're going to start with a quick over overview of the webinar. Well, after a brief introduction to the subject and a couple of definitions, we'll look at the hazards that give rise to a need for hand protection in this sector. And then I'm going to consider the various methods of protecting the hands from injury at work. Finally, we're going to broach some ergonomics factors relating to the adoption of or the resistance to using hand protection. And references are going to be provided and there'll be time, as Paul said, for questions and hopefully some answers at the end. And uh, feel free to share comments with us as well. It's necessary first that I define a couple of things. And um, when I use the term hand uh, or hands, 
um, throughout this presentation. That does include the fingers, the hands, and the wrists, unless it's specifically stated otherwise. And secondly, hand protection includes gloves, mittens, tapes, hand warmers, barrier creams, skincare creams, and the conscious behaviors that people can specifically adopt with the aim of reducing risk of injury to their hands. There's undoubtedly a need for hand protection in agricultural settings such as farms, ranches, forestry, aquaculture because the hands are the body parts most likely to be injured at work from all causes accounting for about 22% of all work-related non-fatal injuries to adults on US farms. And even superficial injuries to the hands can have more profound outcomes. Damage to the skin can increase the risk of absorption of noxious substances, infection, allergic reactions of the body's immune system lacerations, abrasions and disorders like eczema or psoriasis will reduce the skin's effectiveness as a barrier to pathogens, biological pathogens and irritants, toxic chemicals and environmental allergens. So taken together these considerations make the protection of the hands an important health and safety goal for everyone working in agricultural settings. In terms of the hazards encountered in agricultural settings, NIOSH lists the principal causes of injury as being chemical, biological, physical, or mechanical, and there's a little bit more detail given under each of those headings there. We're going to address each of these in more detail. One thing that's worth noting in agriculture is that, that multiple causes of hand injury can occur simultaneously. And these can synergistically increase the risk or severity of harm to the agricultural worker. So, for example, hands can be exposed to laceration from things like barbed wire fences and biological hazards from handling animals subsequently. Uh, or to cold temperatures and hand-arm vibration as shown here with, uh, with the use of a chainsaw in a cold environment. And the resulting injuries when we've got this, this synergistic relationship between uh, multiple hazards can be more serious compared with those arising from any of the hazards working in isolation. Hand protection that's appropriate to the task, the environment and the user reduces the risk of injury and disability whereas inappropriate hand protection can actually have adverse effects on health, safety, efficiency and productivity. In the left hand image here you can See that an operator's glove has become caught in a high-speed milling machine. And this led to cuts and fractures of the hand and the forearm and actually uh, resulted in the prosecution of the business owner. Other rotating machinery, things like PTO shafts, unprotected shafts, can also catch on gloves with severe or fatal consequences. And workers have been pulled through things like wood chippers when their gloves became caught on branches they're feeding into the chipper. So in these cases, the gloves that are intended to protect the worker were key factors leading to their injury. The hazards arising from inappropriate hand protection make this subject important not only to health and safety advisors, but also, of course, to each of us as consumers of hand protection. The need to make the right choices for hand protection is underlined by government standards in this area. The Occupational Safety and Health Agency Standard 1910.138 directs employers to ensure their employees are provided with and wear hand protection which is appropriate both to the task and to the hazards. And even though the OSHA standards may not govern agricultural operations, they certainly provide a valuable framework for best safety practices in this sector. And this standard is undoubtedly consistent with the hand protection needs of agricultural workers. There's also an important performance standard for hand protection which is available, uh, it's issued actually jointly by the American National Standards Institute and the International Safety Equipment Association as number 105 and it was recently updated from the 2005 standard with a February 2011 release. ANSI 105 addresses five aspects of hand protection performance on a pass or fail basis. It also provides a numeric classification by which hand protection that meets the minimum performance standard is rated against a variety of performance tasks. The standard includes guidance in selection procedures for hand protection and it also usefully outlines some ergonomics advice on fit, function and comfort. 
It would be useful for health and safety professionals to refer to this standard if you're advising clients on hand protection or at least to have some knowledge of the standard in your mind. And this webinar doesn't really have the time to go through the standard in detail, but we will be making some passing references to it where appropriate. We now turn our attention to the main hazards affecting our choices of hand protection. Chemical protection is concerned with skin irritants and sensitizers. Skin irritants cause reversible damage to the skin, but some irritants can sensitize the skin so that an allergic response occurs with increased speed or severity with each subsequent exposure to the chemical. Many pesticides contain irritants and sensitizers, and the hands are the body part most likely to be contaminated by pesticides. The most frequent outcome of this contact is contact dermatitis. For pesticide application, barrier creams don't provide effective protection. And the best protection is generally afforded by nitrile or butyl rubber gloves or laminate gloves. But specific chemicals necessitate choosing appropriate glove construction. And we'll discuss glove materials in more detail shortly. For chemical hand protection to be effective, it's obviously important that gloves are used properly, but it's also essential that they're kept clean and in good condition, with no splits or holes, and that they're used as part of an appropriate personal protective equipment system. They must, for example, overlap the cuffs of a long sleeve shirt or protective sleeves that are equally appropriate to chemical protection, leaving no exposed skin to be contaminated by spray or splashes. It's a almost no value wearing gloves but leaving the arms, legs, body or face exposed to contact with the chemical. Chemical protection gloves are generally made from either rubber or plastic materials, a blend of several types of material or laminates of alternate materials. Blended and laminated gloves may afford better chemical resistance as, as will thicker materials, but there will typically be a trade-off in grip and dexterity which could increase injury risk in some situations. So it's essential to choose the optimum glove for each task. Let's have a look briefly at the pros and cons of a few common materials used for chemical protection. Before we move on to these materials, it's worth saying that gloves can fail to protect due to deterioration or degradation of the glove material. It's essential to clean the gloves after use and to inspect them for wear prior to handling chemicals. Gloves can be checked for holes quite simply, in most cases by filling with water, closing the cuff and exerting pressure. Tears, damaged seam welds and the holes will be revealed, but you have to dry the glove prior to use. Discard and replace faulty gloves. A more subtle kind of migration of irritants from the outside to the inside of the glove can, oc can occur with a process called permeation, in which chemicals pass or sort of seep through the glove material itself on a molecular level. And this is why it's essential to select appropriate material for the chemicals being handled and to read the chemical and glove makers safety and application information. And finally, chemicals can penetrate via pores in the glove material, typically found in, in substances like leather or due to the glove construction method, for example, if there are stitch seams. Natural or latex rubber has a few advantages, one of them being that it's, it tends to be fairly comfortable to wear. It's particularly got high tensile strength and elasticity, so it's very resistant to tearing. It's temperature and abrasion resistant and it protects against most water solutions of acids, alkalis, salts and ketones. On the downside, latex rubber is known to cause allergic contact dermatitis in some individuals which we'll consider in more detail shortly. Butyl, a synthetic rubber, protects against a wide variety of chemicals. Some of them are listed here. It resists oxidation, ozone corrosion and abrasion, and it remains flexible at low temperatures. But it's not a good choice for some solvents found in cleaning agents. Neoprene is another synthetic rubber often used in gloves. And neoprene affords good pliability, finger dexterity, high density and tear resistance. 
It's a great choice when exposed to hydraulic fluids, gasoline, alcohols, organic acids, and alkalis. Neoprene gloves generally have chemical and wear resistance properties that are superior to natural rubber. Nitrile is a synthetic copolymer. It protects from chlorinated industrial solvents and it can be optimal for jobs requiring good dexterity and sensitivity. Yet it will stand up to pretty heavy use even after prolonged exposure to substances that would cause other gloves to deteriorate. It provides protection when working with oils, greases, acids, caustics and alcohols. But it isn't recommended for use with strong oxidizing agents, aromatic solvents, ketones or acetones. So one of the first things we need to do is to uh, decide which is the appropriate material for the chemical. And we don't really have to guess this too much. Uh, OSHA's personal protective equipment guide, which is shown here, and I don't propose to go through this in a line by line, obviously. This was published in 2003. I'm going to give you the link on the next page. But it rates from poor to very good the chemical resistance of four different types of glove material used against a variety of substances. Not all of those substances would you encounter in an agricultural setting. But when you're buying chemicals or when your client's using chemicals such as pesticides, fertilizers or cleaning agents for use around the farm or ranch, it's advisable to determine in advance which glove materials will be effective against contamination by chemicals within the product and to obtain appropriate protection before handling it. So although the tables reproduced here, I think probably the best thing to do is to download a copy of this table yourself and there you can see the link uh, to the table and it's a, just a very useful site. So you'll find that on OSHA and um, you can always come back to the webinar and, and write those link details down. A few manufacturers of uh, chemical protection gloves will provide information on applications for their gloves and also limitations of the materials used. For example, depending on whether you're using the gloves um, fully immersed in the chemical or whether it's just some kind of splash resistance that you want. Some provide an interactive selection software system, such as this one, uh, this Specware system, which also allows the user to combine multiple chemicals, which is very useful. Uh, if you want to know the best overall method of protection where chemicals occur simultaneously in any, any material used around the farm or ranch. Glove construction materials themselves can also be irritants and sensitizers. Latex sensitization is common and is caused by a protein occurring in the natural latex. The immune system responds by producing histamine and that response can become increasingly severe in some people and for highly sensitive individuals it can even prove fatal. Uh, typically when gloves are kind of snapped off the hands um, particles of the latex become airborne so uh, either directly or combined with the, uh, the powder that's often used inside the gloves typically a cornstarch powder this results in an allergic reaction by either inhaling the powder or skin contact across a wide area, not just the hands, but including the face. Allergy to PVC or nitrile gloves is less common, but it isn't, it, it isn't exactly rare. Generally, um, they are suitable for pesticide use, and allergy tests, if people have a concern, if they show a, uh, a reaction, can be helpful in determining which, can, which uh, part of the product um, somebody has an allergy to. But like any glove component, they also need to be inspected for damage, they need to be washed, and they need to be replaced if you're using any kind of uh, liner to protect you from, um, from those materials. The FDA has noted that while manufacturers of many products, including latex gloves, often put a label on there suggesting that they're hypoallergenic, uh, this is frequently a term that uh, consumers take to mean that the risk of any allergic reaction is extremely low. Um, this isn't necessarily the case with items containing natural rubber. Hypoallergenic labeling isn't useful and, it, and it's actually not allowed on medical devices that contain natural rubber or latex. At this time, warning labeling regarding latex is required on medical gloves and devices only. So really the onus is on the buyer or the specifier of non-medical gloves 
to establish the materials of which the gloves are constructed and to be aware when you're using a natural latex that these sensitivities can develop. Chemical injury isn't limited only to liquids. Handling some metals can lead to sensitization. Uh, most commonly it's reported for nickel, which is a known sensitizer that results in uh, problems like eczema or dermatitis. Nickel eczema is very difficult to heal and can result in early retirement for some people, depending on uh, the, the trade that they're engaged in. Chemical handling gloves should cover, in this case, the, the distal part of the forearm. So we're talking, to try and get this in line, we're talking about uh, this part of the forearm extending over the cuffs of any long-sleeved garment. And gauntlet designs are therefore generally recommended. But the cuffs really need to be close-fitting, as, as is shown here. And that avoids any chemicals getting in behind the cuff and also reduce, reduces the risk of snagging loose cuffs on any moving equipment. Barrier creams, they're sometimes used to protect the skin from contaminants and irritants like oil or grease or paint. And they're made with either an oil or a water base. Uh, evidence suggests that they might actually be no more effective than products marketed as skin care creams and may even increase the risk for absorption of certain hazardous chemicals through the skin. For pesticide application, barrier creams don't provide effective protection. Some people may find a barrier cream itself to be an irritant. In 2003, one study concluded that while many barrier creams serve a useful purpose by facilitating, quote, the removal of sticky oils, greases, and resins from the skin, decreasing the need to wash with potentially irritating abrasives and waterless cleansers. We, we're not yet really in a position to say whether these creams are actually harmful or beneficial in regard to causing contact dermatitis or preventing it. In general, appropriate gloves together with the right skin cleansing and moisturizing procedures are probably the most effective ways to prevent contact dermatitis if the handling of irritants is really unavoidable. Turning now to the protection of the hands from biological hazards, well, many of those can be found, obviously, in agricultural settings. And the most important of these are known as zoonotic diseases, which are diseases that migrate from animals to humans. Some of them can be fatal and may be transmitted via parasitic bites or as microorganisms uh, through skin lesions on the hands. Horses, cattle, sheep, poultry, and other animals found in agricultural settings including some uninvited ones, rodents, bats, reptiles, as well as cats and dogs. They're all potential hosts for zoonotic diseases. There's a very useful list of these diseases, which uh, I'm not going to go through in, in detail here, but you'll find that um, including um, a discussion of symptoms, the treatments, and good prevention approaches at uh, www.petdoc.ws. The wearing in gloves uh, at that website is, is frequently mentioned in the prevention element for each disease described. Additionally, some plants can cause chemical injury to the hands, acting as irritants and sensitizers. And hazardous plants can include crops and weeds, which we'll, we'll turn to shortly. Gloves, and in some cases repellents, or sometimes a combination of the two, will protect against diseases transmitted by parasites like ticks, biting flies, and mites. Gloves can also help protect against tapeworms, hookworms, and roundworms, which can enter the body orally when eggs are transferred from contaminated hands to the mouth or via open wounds to the hands. Handling animals can cause adverse reactions in people who have or who develop allergies to organic chemicals and microorganisms that originate from the farmed animal from parasites and organisms that live on the animal, or in its bedding, its feed, its water, or its waste. It's important to remove work gloves before entering the home. And that way we can reduce the risk of introducing those diseases and other biological hazards to the rest of the family. It's been estimated that about 5 to 10 percent of patients attending dermatologic clinics are suffering from something called phytodermatitis. This is a, a form of dermatitis caused by plants or plant products. Naturally occurring chemicals in plants account for more than 50 percent of agricultural skin disease, 
pesticide handling by contrast only accounts for less than 20%, according to the uh, Washington State Department of Labor and Industries. And that names a wide variety of plants as sources of mechanical or chemical injury to handlers, from prickly pears and pineapples to celery, carrots, chrysanthemums, and dandelion. Seasonal labor tobacco harvesters in North Carolina are reported as developing contact dermatitis from handling the plants. And even wood, such as West Indian mahogany, silver fir and spruce, can cause contact dermatitis if they're being cut or sanded. Handling grain straw or grain has been associated with skin irritation, but it's generally due to mites rather than a direct reaction to any chemical irritants in those plants. Gloves are often used to provide physical protection and they're certainly used to insulate the hands from excessive heat. Some gloves protect simultaneously against multiple hazards including hot and cold, chemicals and cuts and abrasions. Generally it doesn't mean that we should just adopt a kind of one glove for all hazards approach since trade-offs are bound to occur in some aspects of the, pr of the protection. And sometimes you, you might have to you know, then tolerate a poor fit or reduced dexterity where that itself can actually increase risk for some users and tasks. Still, it, yeah, I have to say that multi-hazard gloves uh, can be a useful addition to an agricultural safety um, store and, and when choosing gloves to protect against the heat, the important uh, parameters that we really need to look at is what kind of temperature are they going have to have to resist. Steam cleaning equipment and steam itself can obviously cause severe burns and would require a waterproof material whereas something like welding gloves wouldn't need that feature but might actually require a higher, higher temperature resistance. Prolonged exposure to ultraviolet radiation for example from the sun is associated with increased risk of premature skin aging and skin cancer at noon on a clear summer day it can take only 15 minutes to cause sunburn on unprotected fair skin. The sun protection factor of 15 is or higher is suggested for skin exposed in that way and the sunscreen should be effective in filtering both UVA and UVB rays. This information would be found on product packaging. Protection against electrical shock is provided by insulating rubber gloves which are classed according to ASTM D120. This subdivides gloves into non-ozone resistant and ozone resistant and then within each of those two groups by maximum voltage for which the protection is provided. Wherever possible the gloves should be protected from cuts and abrasion damage using uh, kind of a leather overglove, a gauntlet kind of style of overglove. But for some tasks that are requiring more dexterity, the rubber glove alone can be used. The insulating glove must extend significantly, as shown here in this, this upper image. Um, it's got to project beyond the gauntlet of the uh, protective leather glove. And uh, the, the, I think the rating these goes up to, as it says here, is up to 36,000 volts and, and uh, it's probably unlikely that most people in agricultural settings themselves are going to encounter that kind of voltage. So uh, these gloves at the higher settings can be extremely expensive and it's really a, a matter of matching the glove to the, uh, the risks encountered or likely to be encountered. It's equally important to prevent the hands from becoming excessively cold since the fingers are particularly susceptible to tissue damage including frostbite when hand tissues freeze due to their distance in particular from core heat sources of the body significant amounts of body heat can be lost through bare hands which increases the risk of hypothermia when working around the farm or ranch in cold weather or in chilled storage areas workers with spinal cord injury diabetes, arthritis, hypothyroidism etc together with elderly workers have increased susceptibility to hypothermia so people suffering from these kind of disorders should pay particular attention to protecting the hands from cold and people who take certain bitter blockers are at elevated risk of frostbite 
and should consult their physician to establish whether any particular protective measures are required because of their medications. In general, mittens provide the greatest protection against cold, but with a major dexterity trade-off. Gloves are essential for handling low temperature materials, including liquid gases, which can cause frostbite extremely quickly. The National Weather Service provides a really useful chart that indicates the relationship between temperature, wind speed, and average time for exposed skin to suffer frostbite. And you can note from this, this chart that the frostbite can occur within 30 minutes, even when the temperature is above freezing, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Hand protection should be specified to cope with the worst case scenario for a given occupational setting. And the risk due to wind chill needs to be part of the calculation that's used to select appropriate hand protection, including not exceeding safe exposure times for ungloved hands. While protecting the user from cold injury, thermal handwear can reduce the wearer's ability to perform tasks requiring dexterity and tactile sensitivity. Handwear can also increase the amount of muscular effort required to grip an object compared with gripping using bare hands which can increase the risk of muscle strain or tendon tears. Gloves and mittens are available equipped with slip-resistant palms and finger pads to provide a better purchase on smooth objects, which will help if additional grip force would other otherwise be required to prevent the object from moving in the hand. Handwear should provide water and wind resistance, but shouldn't be thicker than necessary to maintain a comfortable finger temperature. It's useful to wear several thin layers of hand protection, allowing flexibility according to the task. Mittens can be useful, as I said before, where extremely low temperatures are likely to be experienced, but may be of a type that allows the fingers to be freed for fine and dexterous tasks. However, the hazard from cold conduction must be considered before handling any cold metal parts. So if you anticipate any of that kind of need, maybe coat the contact point of bare metal with a heat insulating material before the onset of low temperatures, which will help to reduce the risk of cold burn injuries. Hand warmer pads and heated gloves are available, the choice of which will depend on the situation. Hand warmer pads can be of the type worn inside gloves, or here they'll reduce dexterity, or in a coat pocket for intermittent warming. Some disposable types provide steady heat for up to eight hours, and heated gloves can plug into a 12 volt power supply or use batteries to heat conductive strands woven into the glove fabric. These generally have a thin insulating liner and some include a choice of different heat settings. Turning to mechanical hazards, the hands are often exposed to friction sources, contact with which results in abrasion injuries. Abrasions are wounds in which the skin is torn or rubbed. Sources of friction include rope handling, moving building materials, blocks, bricks, etc. Powered grinding tools. And gloves provide a barrier against this kind of injury, and would be selected on the basis of abrasion resistance towards the contact surface. As always, thinner, highly resistant materials, such as those shown here, are preferred over heavy, inflexible materials where the task allows that. And finger tape can also be useful in some situations. Gloves are often proposed or promoted to reduce the risk of injuries associated with vibration which may be encountered if you're operating power tools such as chainsaws, brush cutters, or pneumatic drills, plate compactors, and so on. The value for this will be discussed in the next slide, but vibration injuries themselves are typically of five types depending on the physiological system involved. Hence the term circulatory, skeletal, neurological, muscular, and others of a more complex nature such as those affecting the central nervous system in general. Hand-arm vibration syndrome is commonly mentioned when discussing vibration injuries, and this is an injury that involves two or more of these bodily systems. Grip force, hand temperature, and hand-arm postures are risk factors for hand-arm vibration syndrome. Gloves may improve grip depending on the design and working conditions, and the operator should adopt a relaxed grip as much as possible. It's important to keep the hands warm when operating hand tools in cold temperatures, and to position the task optimally for the, for the operator, or the operator optimally for the task. Anti-vibration gloves may not actually reduce transmitted vibration as much as claimed, 
or expected due to the fact that increasing the force applied to a vibrating handle actually increases the transmission of vibration to the palm. Gloves with contact surfaces that resist slipping actually enable reduced grip force and are recommended in preference to heavily padded gloves that might be somewhat slippery on the contact surface. The variation between different wearers' hands, a factor known as intersubject variability, means that different hands react differently to the same vibration. In addition, the standard dealing with human exposure to vibration, ISO 10819-1996, doesn't actually deal with the spectra of vibration frequencies and magnitudes that we typically find in hand-operated power tools. So glove manufacturers that uh, meet this standard may not, in fact, be providing the hoped-for protection in any given situation. It isn't to say that gloves don't serve a useful purpose in reducing vibration injury. For a start, as I mentioned, keeping the hands warm itself can reduce the risk of injury. And gloves with a strong slip resistance may allow a reduced grip force by the user to maintain control of the tool. Flexibility and fit are critical attributes of gloves worn to protect the wearer from vibration injury. Wherever possible, the vibration should be absorbed, obviously, mechanically rather than by the human user which requires a kind of primary or preventative or engineering approach to risk reduction rather than a secondary intervention in the form of gloves. Lacerations to the hands are a major occupational hazard, second only to back strain as the leading cause of lost work time and physician visits. Hand protection from lacerations is very important. Again, wherever feasible, hazards and risks for lacerations should be engineered out of the work. But where it can't be achieved, Gloves and anti-cut tapes can be worn. Not all materials afford equal protection against cuts, of course, and there are currently three standardized methods for testing the cut resistance of materials. Those are shown here. The ASTM test, which is used in the United States, assesses the cut resistance of a material exposed to a cutting edge under specified loads. Data obtained from this test method can be used to compare the cut resistance of different materials. F, F, uh, sorry, ASTM uh, F1790 only addresses that range of cutting hazards that are related to a cutting action across the surface of the material. It's, it's not going to give you any information related to using serrated edges, saw blades, or motorized cutting tools. Nor is it representative of, of, of any resistance to puncturing or tearing or other, other ways that, that fabric can be damaged. So these tests only offer uh, the, the kind of objective cut resistance guide within certain uh, restricted areas. Um, they're useful, but they're not uh, maybe a complete answer to protecting their hands. In ANSI uh, 105, 2011, um, the cut resistance of material is, is uh, categorized, and it's indicated in the table here. You might note that spread of performance within any category makes it necessary to really, if, if we're going to make objective decisions about gloves, to actually know the resulting performance, the actual cut resistance performance of the glove. Because, for example, the difference in cut resistance between a Category 1 glove and a Category 2 glove can be as little as 1 or as much as 799. It's arguable that it would be a waste of money to pay more for a Category 2 glove scoring 500 than one would pay for a Category 1 glove, scoring 499. So absolute test results are, are really useful if we're going to make performance price comparisons between cut resistance gloves. Unfortunately, the actual test results aren't always available, I've found, even in the technical literature. Superior gloves, um, shown here on the left, for example, these are just a couple of good examples of Category 5 cut resistance. And uh, the glove on the left, uh, it states 3,800 grams of cut resistance. So these kind of gloves are going to be ideal for handling sheet metal, glass, uh, maybe in forestry work and so on. But as always, the sharps hazard should be engineered out of the workplace wherever possible. Another type of mechanical injury is bruising or contusions, which occurs because of forceful trauma, like blows from a hand tool or pinching of the skin. And gloves can help to reduce the risk of these injuries by providing a cushioning barrier between the hand and the object striking it so that damage is less likely to affect the deeper tissues of the hand. 
cushioning is generally the approach adopted, but excessive thickness should be avoided in favor of thinner force dispersing materials with particular protection of the knuckles and wrist joints. Matching hand protection to the user requires consideration both of physical fit and some understanding of the issues associated with protective behavior or the lack of it. Matching hand protection to the task will involve an understanding of how the hands are used in the task and might include looking for pushing or pulling actions, dexterity demands, perhaps involving fine manipulation, grasping or gripping of objects, and the application of torque or resistance to rotation. Specifying a safe and healthy work environment actually means mask matching that task to the worker and hand protection isn't any different from any other protective device in that respect. Well, depending on the nature of the task and the duration of use, with gloves, size really does matter. Snugness of fit is one of the most important attributes reported by glove wearers in terms of comfort and usefulness. This is a challenge for glove manufacturers since there's considerable variability in all aspects of hand size and shape, so that almost never will one size fit all. The glove wearer needs to find a glove that satisfies not only the task demands and the protection that involves, but also the degree of fit that makes the glove less of a hindrance and more of a help. To try to help, glove manufacturers provide glove sizing charts, examples of which are shown here. And some makers advocate sizing gloves by hand length, another by knuckle circumference, and yet another by a combination of the two. Sometimes it's hard to know uh, where to start with this, but the glove manufacturer will generally be able to tell you uh, the basis for the dimensions that are given in their gloves. Gloves that stretch to fit are obviously more likely to provide the most comfortable solution, but the materials used are often unsuited to tasks whether it be protection from hot or cold, or from dangerous chemicals. Broadly speaking, the more durable and impervious the barrier, the less likely it will be that the glove fits the user. The lack of fit causes issues like sloppiness when gripping, so that more force exertion is required to grip an object securely, or it might be a restricted range of motion, especially things like splaying the fingers, actually spreading the fingers out, and gloves with predetermined knuckle positions may well be, uh, may be well intentioned, but these can cause as many problems as they solve. It's for this reason that gloves should not be chosen that are unnecessarily protective for the task. It might seem a strange thing to say, but it will require, require a little bit of um, research and experimentation or forethought when choosing gloves. Try before you buy is a great idea, and each worker should get to choose his or her gloves using the same method. Gloves also need to match the demands of the task and the wrong gloves can make a task harder to perform. Recent research, for example, found that muscle activity for a particular task and environment was optimal when, when exerting maximum force in a pushing and pulling direction wearing nitrile glove material. The researcher found that maximum torque performance was enhanced wearing a close-fitting glove compared with an ill-fitting glove or bare hands, but that it was preferable to be barehanded when applying force with precision. Tactility tasks were optimal with a closely fitting glove, while for speed and accuracy results, glove fit appeared to have no effect on performance, and performance was better barehanded. It was reported too that dexterity performance is mainly influenced by task conditions, but the barehanded performance is generally optimal. However, if a glove is necessary for a given task, an optimally fitting glove, which is of thinner material, is recommended. And the researcher concludes that, quote, it is necessary to distinguish the performance components of a task and select the most appropriate glove for optimal performance and the least risk of overexertion. Stack's glove study, as I just cited, had found that maximum torque performance was enhanced wearing a close-fitting glove compared with an ill-fitting glove or bare-handed. This is confirmed independently by glove manufacturers who found that the use of a stable, slip-resistant material integrated into the gripping surface of a closely-fitting glove provides significantly improved coupling to resist axial rotation, especially in wet or oily conditions. 
So for example, when manipulating a long handle garden tool, like a hoe or a shovel, or in tests requiring the application of rotational force, perhaps to tighten or loosen threaded components, close fitting, non-slip gloves will be beneficial. Resistance to using hand protection has been reported for the agricultural sector. In a recent study of compliance rates, rates with NAGCAT work practices recommendations for youth cleaning service alleys in store barns, for example, leather glove compliance rates were extremely low, ranging from a mean of 20.7% for farm resident girls aged 12.7 to 14.7 years to a mean of 0% for non-farm resident boys greater than 14.7 years of age. The overall mean compliance rates were only 9.9% for boys and 10.1% for girls. So ensuring that appropriate hand protection is available, educating all workers about hand hazards, identifying and eliminating all barriers to compliance, and employer or familial reinforcement of hand protective behavior may all have a positive impact on compliance. Skin protection and skin care are both necessary parts of an occupational health system. Cleansing the hands with a neutral pH non-irritant cleanser and remember that foaming agents such as sodium lauryl sulfate are potential sensitizers for contact dermatitis. And the use of, the use of moisturizing skin creams or lotions after washing will help to maintain the skin's effectiveness as a barrier against injury. Effective hand washing and drying facilities should be provided close to where chemicals are to be handled. Clean or disposable towels must be provided and used. Irritations that do occur should be referred to a clinician before any allergy develops as the allergy can end up affecting the whole immune system. Considering farmers and ranchers with disabilities, we also should be aware of whether the disability increases the client's risk for hand injury and if so, in what ways. We need to consider the design of gloves for ag agricultural tasks throughout the seasons. More than one type of hand protection may be necessary for a single task performed in different environmental conditions. We've already mentioned earlier the reduced tolerance to cold that attends some of these disabling conditions. A study by Sorek and his colleagues suggests that the risk of acute traumatic hand injury is around 60% lower when wearing gloves compared with working barehanded. The greatest risk reduction relates to lacerations and puncture injuries, which are second only to back disorders as causes of absence from work. Sorek found that subjects were more likely to wear gloves at the time of injury if they were required to, if they received safety training on the task, and if the company size was less than 50 employees. So th these findings do suggest that a similar approach might be appropriate in agricultural settings. It was also noted that an engineering approach that comprised reducing or eliminating or guarding sharp and puncture hazards would effectively reduce the risk of acute hand, hand injuries uh, further or instead of uh, providing additional hand protection. It's right that any agricultural health and safety audit should include attention to reducing sharp hazards. Training on hand protection should be a feature of extension safety outreach and part of the curriculum on ag safety courses. And I've referred to quite a few um, different studies throughout the presentation. And uh, so what I've included here is uh, a slide with, with references, many of which are, or a few of which certainly are clickable. So um, hopefully you'll find that useful. I've tried to use uh, as much up-to-date information as I could and uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us on this and uh, I'd like to uh, maybe throw, throw the uh, floor open now for questions. But I think, Paula, we do, would you like to go through to the survey first? I'm going to hand you over to Paul and then we'll come back for questions. Thanks very much, Rob, for that very informative webinar. Uh, we will plan after the question and answer session to put that reference sheet back on the screen for a while. 
And um, also, we again will be posting this entire presentation and PowerPoint on our website. So if you did not get all that information, you can always refer back to the archived version. At this point, I'd like to do our um, four quick poll questions, which helps us uh, gauge the effectiveness of the program and also helps us plan for future programs. Our first question uh, asks your professional affiliation. And I realize many of you may have multiple affiliations, but please choose the one that most closely represents you. And after a few more seconds of allowing you to do that, I will go ahead and post the results so that you can see who is from where. OK, thanks very much. It looks like our biggest chunk of people is from AgriBility and uh, several from other organizations. I'll move on to our second poll question now. The information presented in this uh, presentation was valuable and met my expectations. Okay, we'll give you just a couple more seconds to answer, and then we'll broadcast the results. Okay, looks like most of you found it very effective, so we appreciate that feedback. Our third poll question relates to the technology used today. Technology used in this uh, presentation session was effective and usable. If you have specific comments, problems about the technology, also please feel, re feel free to communicate that in the, the chat window or email us. OK, and there are the results from that poll. Our final question, and I'll, I'll just invite you again, please, if you have questions for Rob, we'll be answering those after the next poll question. And feel free to, to type those into the chat window. We will put them in the queue. Final poll question. Based on today's session, I would attend another session in this series. You go ahead and respond to that, please. Okay, thank you for your response on that. At this point, I am uh, going to turn things back over to Rob. I will say we normally have these webinars every six months. Uh, currently, we're looking at a uh, webinar on accessible gardening this next February or March. That has not been confirmed, but just wanted to give you a little heads up on that. So. I'll go ahead and close down my camera, and Rob can come back for questions. Uh, thanks, Paul. So, so we've got some uh, questions up here. Uh, there's also a few comments, so uh, thanks for those. Um, uh, one clarification is latex can be an allergen and an asthmogen. So it can, in fact, call, uh, asthma, cause asthmatic problems as well. And that's, uh, that's correct. Um, there's a question uh, relating. It says, uh, you stated 50% of skin disease due to naturally occurring chemicals in plants against uh, less than 20% for pesticides. Does that include poison ivy and short-lived problems? Or does that mean chronic skin disease like cancer? Well, it certainly, um, it certainly includes um, uh, the uh, contact with uh, things like poison ivy um, short-lived problems within that data. Um, 
But whether, um, whether there was a separation out of cancer, the, uh, the primary data was really mostly concerned with um, uh, things like phytodermatitis and, uh, and contact dermatitis. But, um, you know, whether I, I certainly haven't read uh, any uh, information that suggests there is a cancer link with uh, any of the uh, adverse reactions to handling plants. So I'm not sure if that's actually answered the question or not, but um, uh, I've, as to detail regarding uh, skin cancers from plant handling, I, I just I don't have any information on the, that would allow me to answer that. So I'm, I'm sorry, in my gap in knowledge there. Uh, there's another comment here, the Environmental Working Group, uh, which is www.ewg.org, is an independent organization that rates the effectiveness and safety of sunscreens. So that's, uh, that's a useful thing. And a question, have you found good puncture resistant gloves? Um, well, uh, you know, from, uh, from the, the various bits of uh, research that I was looking at, that, and I think uh, it, this is the last question. Is this the last question that we're running? OK. Um, I, the, the puncture resistance uh, tends to be, um, <laughs> again, it depends on how much uh, force uh, puncture resistance you're looking for. So if you're looking for puncture resistance, for example, from handling uh, thorns um, on plants, then certainly something like a, a good thick glove made uh, either of leather or, or with uh, just a, a very durable, uh, one of the synthetic materials would, uh, would certainly be useful. Um, if you're looking at something, uh, say, in the way of uh, protection from nails, um, then gloves that do protect from that are out there, uh, are out there. I can't uh, recommend any offhand. I, you know, n normally I would be able to do that, but certainly if people would like me to add some information um, or to share it with the uh, Agrability Group on puncture resistance gloves, then I can certainly share the information that I had found. And I didn't cover that in any detail, but they do exist. Um, and basically, the sky's the limit in terms of the amount of puncture resistance you want, but there's always going to be that dexterity trade-off so it very much depends what you, you really need to be using your hands for at the time. And uh, this, is, this is the last question that's, uh, that's come up. What, what glove would you recommend to farm workers working in nurseries and picking strawberries? Pesticide use is, is high in both crops and some nursery plants can cause dermatitis. Okay, well, um, it, it's obviously a dexterous task. It's, it's a task where you need uh, good flexibility. Um, so I would really be looking, in this case, we're not really talking about uh, a major a problem of, um, certainly it's not going to be any immersion or the splashing with the, with the chemicals. Um, you're going to be dr dealing with, uh, with dry chemical. Um, what uh, we're probably aiming for there is, is something that's got uh, perhaps a, a nitrile or a, or a uh, a butyl kind of uh, uh, layer um, with a with a very flexible glove, something that that provides very good um, sensitivity and dexterity, so that you can actually feel the crop, um, and you're not going to damage the crop when you when you're actually picking it. Um, so I think you would want to go back to some of the um, almost the multi-purpose gloves, the uh, the kind of stretch to fit gloves that have just a good um, uh, layer of of uh, one of the man-made materials. Uh, built into the palms and the fingers. Okay, um, we haven't really got any uh, time for any more uh, questions. We have come to the end, and so I'd like to uh, thank you all for your attention to this. It was uh, a lot of detail to get across to you in a fairly short period of time, and um, on the uh, hopefully you'll you'll be able to go to the um, archived uh, webinar and and look up any additional information you need from those resources at the end, particularly in the references. I urge you to get hold of the various um, guidance documents that I mentioned in here. But feel free, obviously, to contact us and ask us for clarification or more information on things, and I'll help in any way I can. Thanks very much, and goodbye.